You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm excited to welcome to the program Andrei Saldata and Irina Baragan, two authors and uh, one of the handful, it seems, of investigative reporters currently working in, in Russia, and uh, we'll discuss their new book, The Red Web, The Struggle Between Russia's di- Digital Dictators and the New Online Revolutionaries, which came out in 2015 and uh, was recognized uh, by many, many different publications, including uh, The Red Web was named a Library Journal Best Book of 2015 and NPR's Best Book of 2015. Andrei Nirino, welcome to the program. Hello. Thank Hello. you for inviting us. Absolutely. Well, um, I guess let, let's start by saying um, what is Russian approach to uh, web surveillance? Is it uh, different from, I mean, it must be different from American or Chinese or um, what? what is uh, Russian approach? I mean, I understand that uh, Mr. Putin is not a big Internet user, but uh, it sounds like he's starting to understand the importance of the medium. Oh, yes. And uh, it looks like he is... Uh very skeptical or suspicious of the internet. He famously said two years ago that uh, actually it is uh, the CIA uh, which is uh, behind the creation of the internet and the Americans are still controlling the internet. And the Russian model of uh, controlling the internet is based on intimidation and more on intimidation than on technology. Uh, for lots of reasons, and uh, partly it's a um, direct legacy of the Soviet Union. Uh, even in the Soviet Union, uh, while we all remember that the KGB was all-powerful and had enormous uh, resources, uh, actually, technically, it was not a very advanced uh, security uh, service. And uh, they had problems with uh, eavesdropping phone calls, mostly because uh, the telecommunication system of the country was extremely extremely weak. That's why already in the 80s and 70s, uh, the biggest um, tool uh, for the KGB was to send a message, a very clear message that you might be spied on, and it's better to be cautious. Uh, The Russian approach actually repeats the same idea. Uh, They try to use all kinds of means to send a very strong message that you might be spied on uh, on your phone or or when you try to write something on social media. And it seems like every media person that I speak to in Russia or what I read about on Facebook, it seems to have their own, uh, almost a handler from the security services who fought, you know, who, who kind of lets them know where on the scale of permissible they currently reside. Is, is that a common approach in your opinion? Oh, I don't, I don't think so that every person who are working on, on the media have has uh, his or her own handler today because, you know, that the FSB are uh, not so big as the uh, KGB used to be. And uh, there are a lot of surveillance over independent journalists and opposition politicians, but the things are not so bad uh, as it used to be in the totalitarian state, USSR, because, you know, the Russian state is a new one and it's authoritarian model, not not the same. The, Surveillance is not total. It's selective and focused on some uh, some journalists, some opposition politicians, and some people. Not all of them, as it used to be. But maybe I've just been successful in getting very interesting people to be on my program. I I feel privileged. Maybe, maybe. Well, I I think the the key question these days is uh, when it comes to Russia and America is trying to figure out to what extent Russia may have been involved in influencing the outcome of American elections and in particular uh, to what extent uh, Russian secret services or Internet hackers have been able to um, successfully uh, get information from Democrats and perhaps Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what do you see this being your area of expertise and you working from, you know, kind of studying the Russian side first? Um, 
in my opinion, it's always been more about the intent versus capabilities because the intent to influence probably was was there always, but the abilities have been limited. Has that changed? Uh, it's actually it's a very tricky question because uh, with uh, the Kremlin and cyber, nothing is uh, what it seems. Uh, sometimes you might be, but you might think or you might expect that security services would be behind cyber attacks, but actually. Uh, informal actors, people who enjoy direct access to the Kremlin, but not part of any uh, government institutions, might be much more adventurous, and they might be on the front line of uh, these cyber operations. And that was the case for many, uh, many incidents, uh, because actually we have a lot, very long history of cyber attacks launched from, say, Russia, attributed to Russia. It's all started at least in uh, 2007 with attacks on uh, Estonia. And in almost in all these um, uh, cases, you might identify informal actors. Uh, people uh, are working for pro-Kremlin youth movements, uh, people who might have some PR contracts, people who might be informally connected or tied to the administration of the president. And it is extremely, extremely uh, helpful uh, for the Kremlin because it uh, helps them to create uh, a plausible deniability. It also uh, helps to lower the risks and the costs of, uh, say, controversial operations. And it seems it's still the case, uh, and still the case for the United States because uh, that's the problem with the evidence uh, which we so far uh, see presented by uh, the American side. Uh, we maybe can understand the intentions. Uh, we now we try to argue about the <coughs> motivations of uh, these attacks. The problem is to understand and to identify, identify who exactly was behind these attacks. And uh, about some people, some tech companies try to say, look, we think it should be, say, military intelligence. Others say, no, this particular group. Uh, well, seems to be working for the FSB. But all evidence is extremely sequential. Like the idea why behind one of the group is the military intelligence is because this group is known to attack uh, military targets uh, in the past. Well, of course, it's not just enough because a lot of people might be after military targets of interest for the Kremlin. And as I said, they love to use uh, informal actors. That's why this, uh, we have uh, this very complicated uh, world. And it's actually, it's already ex well exploited by the Kremlin. Remember the very first remark made by the spokesperson of Putin, uh, of uh, Dmitry Peskov, uh, he made in uh, June. So actually, the next day when uh, the whole thing was uh, exposed by the company called CrowdStrike, uh, which was involved in mitigation of uh, the attack on DNC. And he said, look, I believe uh, that there are no government institutions and organizations behind this attack. So, of course, we understand what does it mean. It means that he tried to make a point that it's not about government institutions, not about security services. But he actually he didn't say anything about informal actors. And so it's, it's very tricky. But at the same time, Andre, uh, uh, it's clear that the Kremlin has increased uh, its ability to, uh, in terms of cyber attacks, in comparison with the late 2000s, uh, because Absolutely this agree. cyber yeah. attacks against against Estonia, this was a, some kind of simple attack like DDoS attack or even uh, DOS attack. But the new one, uh, I mean, hack, uh, hackers intrusion into the DNC system, it was uh, conducted in very sophisticated way, and uh, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of proxies and contractors, including hackers, involved in organizing of these attacks. Totally agree. You know, and that's and that really, I think, points at a, at a very interesting issue because, on one hand, uh, obviously, if you outsource. Uh, these kinds of attacks to outside actors, as you say, Andre, then uh, you're, you're looking at less chance of uh, this being tied in directly to you. Um, but my question there is how, you know, 
how much can be done on this front without permission from up above. Now, in Russia, there is a tendency to uh, confuse direct permission and direct assignment from what's in, in Russian is called running ahead of the train, where people who try to show initiative in direction that they feel the management is endorsing. So, so that's I guess, I guess let's start with that. Do you feel that uh, these freelancers could be a totally rogue uh, versus you know, maybe at best running ahead of the train, or do you think that breaking into DNC uh, would require some kind of higher authorization? Well, I think uh, it's, it's clear it's required some higher authorization, and on the top level, I I I I mean that Vladimir Putin have to be have to be fully aware of this and he have to approve has has to approve this operation it's uh, because it's so sensitive i mean for him it's a kind of a personal uh, uh thing for at least two reasons first because uh, it looks like the initial goal of uh the attack was uh Hillary Clinton and and her campaign and Hillary Clinton is seen by uh, by the Kremlin and by Putin as a kind of uh, uh, <laughs> Russia hater because she is believed to be behind the Moscow protests in 2011-2012. And people in the Kremlin, they believe that she, in a way, encourages the protesters. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's a, it's a very personal thing for Putin. Uh, and also there is a second reason is uh, that uh, lots of people now I uh, think that might be uh, this attack on DNC was prompted by uh, by Panama Papers leak uh, because Panama Papers uh, Papers revelation and uh, remember that it was about for Russia it was about uh, a personal friend of Putin, Mr. Aldugin, and about a lot of money. So this uh, leak was and this investigation was seen as a direct personal attack on Putin. Uh, so I do not think that, and I totally agree with Rina, uh, I don't think that this kind of attack on, uh, could be done without uh, a direct, uh, um, well, and, well, of no, uh, without knowledge of uh, Vladimir Putin. All right. And then um, what about uh, the WikiLeaks con- leaks connection there? Do you feel that there is something that uh, WikiLeaks is an independent uh, from from your investigative reporting, from from what you know, uh, do you feel that they are an independent entity, or are they uh, getting sources from Russia that they may not even be aware of that those are Russian connections, or uh, how do you see that uh, part of the story playing out? Uh, I feel that uh, initially WikiLeaks was absolutely absolutely independent entity, but uh, I don't know since two thousand. 12th, maybe 2011, uh, WikiLeaks uh, started to cooperate with the Kremlin, firstly with the Russia, uh, with the uh, with the TV channel Russia Today, and then there was a lot of evidence that they are in some kind of connections, and I think that some uh, that the stroke of uh, Clinton's archives that was posted on the WikiLeaks website was. Uh, uh, was transferred and somehow to Assange or his people uh, from 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 Russia, from Kremlin's people, by the Kremlin's people. I think the biggest problem with WikiLeaks is uh, we actually we do not actually understand uh, uh, the standards, uh, the ethics of this uh, of this entity, because of course we are very far from say journalistic standards, and uh, people behind WikiLeaks they sometimes they pause and they say that they, that they are journalists. Uh, but of course, we are, it's absolutely clear that we are not, not extremely scrupulous uh, with these sources. They also try to develop their own ethics. Uh, they, if you remember, they try to say that we uh, create a special system uh, which would uh, prevent us from knowing our sources because we care about our sources and we need to build this wall. But actually, it was not the case from the beginning, and I know personally that it was not the case that WikiLeaks sometimes, uh, and people behind WikiLeaks might contact people directly and ask them to provide some information. And So it looks like there is a big confusion over what kind of information, what kind of sources we can use. And because we, well, that's, that's might be the biggest problem of, the pro- of this project. Is that it's a mess? Uh, yes, actually, it's, I think it's uh, kind of these people, they don't, 
quite know where they are uh, in terms of uh, media, in terms of um, investigations, uh, whether they say digital investigators, they are helpers of leakers or whistleblowers, uh, or maybe they are journalists, and um, it's it's a very tricky situation for for everybody. I, I presume, Andre and Irina, that you have not communicated with Mr. Assange directly, but do you have an impression that he is aware of where his information is coming from, or is he, I mean, I can't imagine Mr. Assange being naive, but does he know that uh, where where his sources are, or does he not care? I mean, he, I, uh, he doesn't care. It's uh, very difficult to say in every particular case, because you know that there was, uh, sometimes he, I, I think that sometimes he, uh, he was fully aware of where information come from, and uh, there was some cases when uh, it was um, it was clear that he uh, cooperated with some representative of the Kremlin and uh, gave uh, these people uh, some information for for. Uh, let, me, let me just yeah, give one yes. example. I, I mean, uh, just to be more. Uh, to, to pro- to be more factional. Uh, um, but some years ago, there was an interesting story uh, exposed by... Actually, there was a story about a website uh, launched by some disenchanted FSB uh, agents. And they posted some very interesting documents about the FSB. And for some strange reasons, uh, Irina and I, we were the only journalists reporting uh, this story. So we had a story about this website, about these documents, and maybe two days passed, and I got a call from London, from Wikileaks. And uh, Wikileaks told me, uh, well, you should, uh, well, well, send all these documents to us. And of course, this situation is very far from what they claim to be, uh, the uh, relationships with, uh, with the sources. Because they directly approached me, they asked me to provide some documents to them. And I was really astonished because, uh, uh, of course, everybody remember that back then it was all about this talk about this wall between WikiLeaks people and their sources. In this case, it was absolutely clear that there, that there is no any wall between the sources and, and WikiLeaks people. Do you feel that WikiLeaks is actually trying to stifle reporting on Russia? Uh, well, they have very strange, say... When they chose, choose people to cooperate with in Russia, they make a very strange choice. Like when they had this uh, big thing about, um, uh, about uh, diplomatic cables, for some strange reasons they decided to pick up in Russia, not, say, some independent newspaper like Norway Gazeta, but they decided to cooperate with uh, Ruski Repartor, which is uh, almost directly funded by the administration of the president and is seen as a very pro-Kremlin media. And it's, it's always like that. If you look at people they are working with uh, in Russia, it's always like that. And that's very really strange. So you might say maybe they might make one mistake or two mistakes, but it looks like a strategy. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM, The Edge in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm speaking today with authors of The Red Web, Web, The Struggle Between Russia's Digital Dictators and the New Online Revolutionaries, a nonfiction English language book by Russian journalist Andrei Soldatov and Irina Boragan. And um, Andrei and Irina are uh, my guests on the program today. Going back to the trying to, to determine if uh, if there's a connection, if there's official connection or unofficial connection. I mean, I'm sure there's no signed contracts between Kremlin and uh, some kind of a hacker group saying, uh, you know, we, we will um, break into DNC's and RNC servers and you will pay us this much and this is the invoice. Um, but uh, when we're talking about things like uh, groups like Cozy Bear, Fuzzy Bear and all those kinds of organized entities, um, do you feel that those were directly um, supervised, if, if guided? And also you mentioned that since 2007 there has been a great improvement in uh, the sophistication of Russian cyber forces. Um, does this all kind of tie in that this is the, the, the new Russian army, that they're sitting, you know, like they were talking about um, American new army where it's people sitting in front of TVs and, and guiding drones and, and the Russians are the, the hacker army? Is that 
you know, because it, it seems like it's easier than building a decent um, aircraft carrier. Um, well, it's, uh, it's it's the most well, it's understandable, but uh, when you try to figure out and to portray uh, to, to understand how these people could look like, you can try to to imagine these people might be in some sort of uniform. Uh, well, because it's all because of all this talk about cyber weapons and uh, cyber cyber attacks. The problem is that the situation might be a bit more complicated. Um, it looks like no, we are... No, no complications. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the thing is that it looks like we saw <coughs> at least um, two stages. Um, there was a first stage. Um, it started in 2007, and it looks like it ended in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. And back then, it was mostly as arena. Uh, pointed very correctly, it was mostly about DDoS attacks, a very simple thing. And technically, and in terms of organization, uh, what you need when you launch DDoS attack, you need to know some people in some criminal underworld, and you need to buy some botnets. Actually, it's about buying something, some sort of tool, and then you can deploy these tools against your targets. And that makes um, that, that, that made sense. And it looks like back then it was about some criminal uh, hackers uh, who didn't want to be directly connected to the Kremlin and to the security services because they because of some fear of being exposed. So they just uh, produced some stuff and uh, were absolutely happy to sell this stuff to people who then can deploy this against. Well, people are well, opposing the Kremlin, say. But it looks like now we are living in the second stage. And this second stage uh, needs much more preparation, much more, in terms of skills, it's much more sophisticated. It's mostly about the tactics uh, known as a spear fishing, and, uh, which means that you, target your, you attack your target with lots of emails, which looks like real emails from your, say, from your company or from, I don't know, Gmail. And uh, finally, you can make a mistake and respond, and that's a way to steal your passwords and uh, your personal details. So these kind of tactics needs much more, well, it's much more sophisticated. It needs uh, some skills in so-called social engineering. The problem is that, uh, that it looks like at least already for maybe two years, uh, because of this climate of mobilization that we have in our society, because of the annexation of Crimea, now Kremlin started to put more pressure on the IT industry. And we need to remember that uh, the engineers uh, in Russia were always quite well, good. And we, uh, back in the Soviet times, we enjoyed the largest engineer community in the world. So we have lots of these people. And these people uh, were trained in a very special kind of way. They, they were trained to solve and to, well, to work for uh, either the military industrial complex or the security services. And it's still the case for many technical schools. And it means that lots of these people who today might work for completely independent private companies, they still have a very special kind of mentality, which means that if, say, someone wants to approach them, and ask them to help the state with some sensitive things, they might be, well, inclined to accept and to help. And we already saw some example when uh, at least one very good private company was approached by some Kremlin people and people from the ministry uh, and asked it to launch, uh, actually to launch a DDoS attack on uh, some independent media in Russia and on uh, the website in Ukraine. And, uh, well, these officials, we just asked to land uh, a gig, a technical expert, and to have him uh, sent to, uh, to, uh, to Sofia in Bulgaria. Well, they duly obliged, and uh, we found a guy, sent them to, to send him to uh, Sofia. And, uh, well, well we, we know this story only because this guy, finally, he got so scared that he fled the country and uh, sent all his... Uh, uh, transcripts and all his uh, emails to, to journalists. But it's kind of a very good illustration of the new scheme, of the new relationship between the Kremlin and the IT industry. So uh, somebody from Kremlin, from security services, approaches 
a private company with the kind of a job that they want them to do. And while you're never going to have 100% compliance, I would imagine that in Russia, it's 99.9%. What the government wants you to do, that's, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it's a very plausible explanation. Also, because, not only because we have uh, these people, uh, I mean, engineers to be so uh, patriotic, but also because of fear. Because now to say no to the government, yeah, it's a very big, it's a very big problem. It's very difficult to oppose Kremlin in any direction, because you would be punished. <laughs> right. Um, let me ask you this: that I, th- I think that this is where the, the conversation and debate has been moving towards on the question of hacking and uh, and Russia and. What what is the appropriate response? Are we supposed to be? Should we be bombing Kremlin? That seems kind of out of the question, and I think Mr. Putin knows this as well. Um, what what would be um, the appropriate way, in your opinion, to stop these attacks or um, at least make uh, Russian government feel like we care to the level on which they're able to comprehend? Well, it's a very big question for say, for all cyber experts in the world. Actually, nobody knows how to respond to these kind of attacks, uh, whether to, well, to, to see these attacks as a kind of military offensive and to respond with military means, which seems to be a bit too far, or to try to use some asymmetrical response and nobody knows what it is. So it looks like maybe now the best response is to give, to declassify all evidence about Russian hackers. That might be the best approach because um, while to try to say, to send a message could be played against uh, and actually we, we already saw these things uh, uh, just, I think it was just three or four weeks uh, ago when NBC uh, exposed a story that um, the United States are thinking of uh, some sort of retaliation or some sort of cyber attacks against uh, Russian targets. Immediately inside of Russia, this was played by the Kremlin and, and the message to the public inside of Russia was, look, now you see the hard evidence that the United States try to exploit the internet against us. So we need to get more repressive legislation, we need to protect our information space against hostile forces, we need to I don't know, to suppress uh, internet freedoms even more than we suppress them, uh, these freedoms now. So this kind of message might be really, really uh, tricky. So maybe well, but, the best... But it's, it's also you know, a one-way street, because no matter what uh, America says, Russia can say, well, you see... Now we have mm-hmm. to have more repressive laws, and it doesn't. In a way, it doesn't even matter what the United States says. But so, what do we do? Yeah, maybe as I said, maybe the best option is just to try to. Well, as far as I get it, uh, and of course you are closer to uh, to these things, uh, so maybe you can uh, you, you can face me. I mean, uh, we are dealing now with uh, several reports uh, prepared by several law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies. And uh, so it looks like we have some data, some real hard evidence about the Russian hacking attacks. Uh, in the open, uh, we have only uh, the reports provided by technical companies. And actually, in case, well, in terms of um, hard evidence, uh, which is uh, available uh, publicly, we are still at the point of June, so when the whole thing was exposed by CrowdStrike. And by far, it's the most detailed explanation and uh, observation of what actually happened. So maybe now it's time to uh, provide some real evidence uh, gathered by uh, intelligence agencies, by law enforcement agencies, and to name some names. That would be really, really interesting. All right. You're listening to WSU 91.7 FM. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. My guests today are Andrei Saldatov and Irina Baragan authors of The Red Web, The Struggle Between Russia's Digital Dictators and the Online Revolutionaries, um, which was in 2015, uh, named the Library Journal Best Book of 2015 and NPR's Best Book of 2015 as well. Um, perhaps in conclusion, a uh, topic that I think kind of looking forward, um, it appears that uh, uh, Mr. Trump is going to be our next president, and uh, he seems to have uh, very good feelings towards Russia and Putin. And as much as uh, I think 
a lot of people would like to get to the bottom of what happened with hacking, it, I think, is going to become the story that we're going to be paying more more attention to in the future is the warming relations between uh, Russia and uh, United States, especially as it is seen through um, installment of uh, different officials in the United States who seem to be very friendly towards Putin and Russia. Um, first of all, do you feel that there will be, uh, do you think that this kind of um, thawing is going to result in, in fewer attacks uh, against American targets or is it not going to affect them? And second of all, do you have any thoughts on those officials that are being installed in a Trump administration and what is a friendlier relation between America and Russia um, may actually look like and result in? You know, that's not an easy question because, you know, that Trump is absolutely unpredictable for us. And we can say what is going to be. And it seems uh, the Kremlin is uh, is waiting for warming relationship. But I'm not sure that it would be so. And uh, if it would be so, it's clear that the Kremlin didn't need any kind of hackers attack into any, any, uh, any American system. But let's see that's very difficult to that's very difficult to say anything because you know it's complicated and i'm not i'm not so sure that trump um that trump's foreign policy will be very very favorable of russia I, i'm not sure i'm sure andre uh well actually no <laughs> i think the, the problem is that it looks like nobody knows and um it it's actually, it looks like it's already affected the way the Kremlin tried to portray uh, what is going on now in the United States. I mean, there was such a great jubilation initially, but now it seems that uh, people are getting more and more cautious and they don't know what to expect. And now the main thing is to try to celebrate not Trump, but his policy in appointing some officials like uh, um, he is a state secretary. And so maybe they also, they don't know what to expect from this, uh, from his new administration. Um, and that's, I think that's, that's the biggest problem because these two guys, I mean, Putin and Trump, they are known for their unpredictability, uh, that they are absolutely unpredictable. And, uh, well, nobody actually, I, I don't remember this kind of combination. <laughs> so what actually might happen, nobody knows. Andrei Saldatov, Irina Baragan, thank you for being on Rashkin Report. Thank, thank you. you for having us. You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to Rashkin Report.